All right, another midweek recorded Aftershock. I brought back someone who, for many of you, is probably almost like an old friend. It's got to be like putting on an old pair of jeans, a, a comfortable sweater. Anthony Passarelli, the former voice of the San Jose Earthquakes on the TV side. Anthony, how are things going these days? Thanks, Jamin. Things are going great. Gosh, I hope it's like a comfortable pair of uh, jeans or sneakers. Um, yeah, glad to be doing this. And uh, I even broke out some of the old swag that we got when we were oh, there you go. Yeah. Earthquakes. So that's happy right. to see you. One of the great things about being around the club is on occasion, you'll just like get swag. They'll just be like, oh, here we have a jacket for you or, you know, whatever. Uh, it well, happens on, on rare occasions for guys like me. Well, and you don't want to be wearing the old logo in front of anyone in the front <laughs> office because that's well. And if you do that, that's a surefire way to get a new piece of swag. So, uh, yes, <laughs> this is I believe this is the most recent. Um, but if it's not, my apologies. I think you're telling me that next time I come to the to the bay, I need to be wearing only old swag, so I will get new swag. So I, I, I might be what, saying I might be I saying that. Say. I might be saying that. Yes. <laughs> so, Jed Meddy, if you're watching this, I could use a little bit more swag, as could we all. So, uh, you know, Anthony, uh, you came, you know, to the earthquakes a few years back as the television voice, and and at the time, I I wasn't personally familiar with your work. You've been doing broadcasting in the Bay Area for some time. But, you know, really quickly, it became a very comfortable thing. You and Chris Dangerfield as a combination kind of became throughout the, uh, you know, the the kind of a, a via years era, I guess you could say, uh, kind of became that duo that, uh, you know, you would just turn on CSN Bay Area and you knew you were going to get to hear Anthony Passarelli, Chris Dangerfield, and you guys had had such a, a close thing together and then added, you know, Daniel Slayton later on into the mix. Talk to me a bit about, like, how did that gig come about for you? Um, and remind me again exactly what year you, you started doing that. Yeah, well, it's funny. You mentioned TV. And um, we, we actually started, I started on radio in 2012. And so I was in the Bay Area. I grew up in the Bay Area, went to middle school and high school here in South San Jose, the Cambrian area. Well, high school downtown, but, um, and then uh, I went away to college and got started in radio, uh, working at a couple of stations, one in Chico, where I went to college at Chico State, and then again in, in Sacramento. Uh, I also did some minor league baseball, but I was uh, back in the Bay Area and uh, looking for more work, and I figured, um, you know, I can do basketball, can do football, can do baseball, but the earthquakes and I think soccer, um, having been a youth soccer player in the Bay Area and seeing the Quakes play at Spartan Stadium in the 80s, um, that's something that I could definitely, uh, A, see myself doing and B, see myself needing to get a lot better at. So um, hmm. I ended up uh, doing some fill-in basketball for San Jose State and uh, then uh, got a phone call from Santa Clara asking if... I would be interested in doing some uh, online streaming of women's basketball for them after my time filling in at San Jose State came to an end. I said, absolutely. Uh, so I got connected with Santa Clara, ended up doing their men's basketball um, and met Jed Meddy, who uh, uh, is a member of the Quakes front office staff. Uh, Jed had worked at Santa Clara at that time. And then he went over to the earthquakes and I asked him, I said, hey, do you mind if I bring my recording devices to any open booths you have at Buckshaw Stadium. Now, you remember Buckshaw, not a lot of open booths there. But <laughs> no. uh, for, 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 oh, for a couple of Open Cup matches, uh, I brought my recording devices and I, you know, did my best. And uh, having played, but not really having, uh, I guess, achieved a high level of success playing, uh, I had a lot to learn. So I gave him the tapes and I said, I know you have your broadcasters now. I just want to get better. Maybe I could do some college somewhere. Or maybe I could fill in for you down the line. Uh, he listened to those tapes and said, uh, first of all, don't play these for anybody else <laughs> because you have a lot of work to do. Um, and it's something that, you know, even through my time with the earthquakes, um, I still feel like, you know, it can always get better. There's always things you can learn, but uh, I ended up, uh, was going to fill in on radio. I think uh, the gentleman who was doing it before me, John Schrader, longtime Quakes broadcaster, ended up moving to Southern California. And so I got an opportunity to, to do some games there. And after two years with Danger on radio, my first year being 2012, the Supporters Shield winning season, I thought, 
oh, this is great. We're going to the playoffs every year. We've got a great team. <laughs> um, they had uh, some changes they wanted to make in the in the booth, um, in the TV booth, and they were going to bring in Danger to do some work there. Uh, I think something fell through with the person they wanted to have come on and do the play-by-play. And so they said, well, you've worked with Danger. Why don't you come in and, and do it? And I was terrified. Terrified. But yes. somehow somehow got better. Uh, as you as as you said, you, it it became something that uh, you know. I always felt you know as as local play by play goes. I thought I always felt like we were really very fortunate to have have both you and Danger together. I, I always felt that there's you know there's kind of a a mixed bag in terms of MLS in terms of you know kind of Homer announcing, uh, but also you know people who who maybe fit a particular type of niche. Uh, as a, as an announcer or broadcaster, right. and, and I felt that you guys both kind of took it up a level from almost all the other broadcasts that that we've heard around Major League Soccer. You know, over time, you know, what was the what well, was the thank thing you that, by the way? That you, what was the thing that uh, that you kind of had to pick up and 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 learn so that you know it, it came more naturally for you? Oh gosh, so much. Um, so, and I, after we, we knew we weren't going to be back for this season, I did a big hug and a thank you to Chris. Uh, so danger, um, kind of shepherded me through a lot of that. Um, and I'm sure it was frustrating for him, for him, because, um, you know, like some people have pointed out, I started in basketball and baseball and football. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a, a kind of a learning curve for me, even though I did a couple of years on radio and the medium is different, right? So radio to TV and radio, I'm kind of crafting my own story, putting together what I want to tell um, with danger. Um, and I'm kind of driving it. And then with TV, obviously you have a truck, you have a director and a producer and you've got right. um, whether it was Kate Scott early on or, or Danielle uh, toward the end there, uh, you want to make sure you get their insights in as well. So there's a lot more going on. So one of them was just getting used to the new medium. I had never done TV before. I mean, we've, I'd done some on-camera work, but never TV to this degree. Right. Um, and the other one was uh, just kind of understanding uh, that I couldn't take it personally when I would make a mistake on air and the social media wizards would, would uh, the keyboard warriors would climb all over me, <laughs> uh, look at it as an opportunity to learn, right? So I had to kind of let that go. And it took a few seasons and just then try and make sure that you're you're being correct with the information you're saying. I mispronounced some names early on in the season, my first year, and that was memorable. Like, okay, <laughs> now I need to change the way I go about preparing. Um, right. But everything from, you know, the types of, of phrasing I should be using all the way down to when to let danger do, be danger. Because really, my job, the way I look at it as a play-by-play -play guy, is to set up the analyst. And so if I can set danger up to tell stories or talk about why he thinks what's happening is happening on the field and then bring Danielle or Kate or whomever was, was help was the third person down on the field. Um, I'm more of a traffic cop. And so um, that was something I needed to get used to as well, but so much to learn. And I, even when we finished last year, I still felt like, all right, I think I'm probably ready to do this now, 12 years in. Probably a good opportunity to just mention a congratulations to both Kate Scott and Danielle Slayton. They're both going to be part of the Women's World Cup crew. Does it seem crazy to you that they were once just sideline reporters for the San Jose Earthquakes? Obviously, they've got very deep backgrounds in soccer and other sports. In fact, Kate now the the uh, the play by play voice for the 76ers. But yeah. you know, it, it you know, was it very clear how talented they were the very first time you work with them? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, e a easy to work with. B, uh, they're like sponges. So Danielle obviously played at a high level. Right. Um, I don't know. I mean, Kate wanted to do play by play um, very early. I mean, you could tell she did her she did her job with the earthquakes extreme at an extremely high level. But um, in my conversations with her, she wanted to do play by play, and so um, she very good at networking, uh, very talented and very driven. And when you put those three, three things together, uh, anybody who wants to get to a certain job level or get to a certain area of broadcasting, they're going to do it. And so it was very clear, very early for both of them, to me anyway, that um, it was going to be wherever they wanted to be was where they were going to be. 
what as things were probably starting to get more comfortable for you, more natural for you in, in, in calling these games and, you know, maybe in your, your now your third, fourth year in television, now we get hit with the pandemic. At that point in time, you're very used to calling those games in person. Now you're asked to call them off a screen. And even in the stadium, there were nights where it was literally you, Danger, Ted Joe, me, Joel Soria, you know, yeah. Alex Morgan, there was like 10 of us and we were the only people in the stadium that were not part of the two teams that were playing on the pitch and witnessing this game live. Talk to me a bit about that whole kind of pandemic uh, time time as a broadcaster. Yeah, and it was, um, I tried to black it out, Jamin, actually, no. Um, so <laughs> before the pandemic hit, uh, we had done a couple of games uh, remote from back in the Bay Area and in the studio in San Francisco. So the Pac-12 studio studios there in San Francisco uh, gave us a booth. Um, and I'm sure we paid for it. The Quakes are um, CSN Bay Area. Uh, but we would do get a couple of games from there. For example, Montreal. It didn't make sense for us to all go to Montreal. It's expensive and everything like that. So they kind of said, well, these couple of games, you're not going to travel before the pandemic. So right. we knew how to do it, but uh, I think there were games where we would have technical difficulties. We might lose the natural, uh, the natural sound from wherever the stadium was. And so we're in our headsets looking at each other. Like, are we on? What's going on? So a lot of talking with our producers. And then I think we did two, was it two home games to start that season? And the pandemic hit. And right. then it was, are there going to be any more games this year? And then it got close to, okay, we might be doing an MLS's back tournament. We won't be doing those games because because those games are going to be done on the national uh, uh, broadcast. That's right. And then we just stopped traveling. I mean, we proved that we could do a, a high-quality broadcast, I think. Um, at least that's what I remember. And so I think it became um, kind of a budget thing. And it was, okay, we can still do the broadcast without traveling. Um, and so that's what we did the last couple of years. I want to say 20, 21, 22, and 23. I don't know if maybe we traveled to four matches all season. And so mm -hmm. obviously there are, personally, I prefer to be at the game because I can see even if the camera's on the play, I can see if somebody's down behind the play, Danger can see the full scope of you know, what, what the um, formation is or where guys are jumping into spots. And you remember Matias, it was, you know, you had to really follow closely to figure out where guys were jumping <laughs> into play right. and sprinting back or not sprinting back. And um, so that was difficult. And we relied heavily on the Quake staff, the PR staff that was in person. So for example, in a lot of cases, they, we couldn't see every substitution that was happening. So all of a sudden you've got two players that you didn't even know were on the sideline coming into the game. Now it didn't happen a ton, but um, there were quite a few difficulties and frustrations. Uh, hopefully it didn't show through too much on the broadcasts, but um, I, I, obviously I don't think anybody would argue it's better to do the games in person if you can. And um, the decision was made that, that we wouldn't be doing that. And I think we weren't the only team. I think there are quite a few teams that have gone to remote road broadcasts and may still be doing it or would have still been doing it had the deal with Apple not happened. Right. I think, it, I think obviously the deal with Apple kind of changed things from a local broadcast perspective. Some local broadcasters, I think, have continued on with Apple TV. But it is different to now have every single game. It's, it's a different set of broadcasters. Sometimes we get Danielle, and that's you know, more comfortable, I think, for fans. But certainly, there's a bit lost about uh, local broadcasting, you know, uh, been lost in this transition. And I think the same is, is starting to become true maybe for other sports. I think baseball is going through a bit of this, you know, as well right now as things, you know, move into these kind of centralized deals. You know, just give us your thoughts in terms of, you know, what that kind of means for local broadcasting. Clearly, with your, you know, college uh, opportunities that you have, there's still places to get that, that local broadcasting feel. Yeah. So I st I'll still do work with Santa Clara. Um, this is the first summer I haven't worked, whether it's at the KCBS station in San Francisco or doing Quakes broadcasts um, since probably 98. So I'm still getting used to, you can't see it, but I'm wearing flip-flops right now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm still getting Aren't used to kind of, <laughs> right? I'm still getting used to what I will be doing. Uh, and I've, um, uh, but the changes with the broadcast format 
Um, so the NFL does this, right? The NFL doesn't have local broadcasts. That's true. They're on That's Fox or ESPN or NBC or CBS. Uh, I'm sure I missed somebody there. There's probably like Peacock or Amazon or somebody's got NFL <laughs> yeah. rights. Uh, something Amazon's got another rights thing now. Yeah. So it's not. So it's not entirely foreign. But as a kid who grew up in the Bay Area, listening to local broadcasters, uh, uh, Bill King and you know some of those guys who every broadcaster aspires to reach that level. Um, there's that flavor that's missing. And so I, you know, while I totally get why it's being done, um, I think there, you do miss some of that, um, uh, some of that access that the broad, the local broadcasters have that they can bring to the story and the energy behind it as well. I got way more excited on a Quakes goal, um, than I would for, you know, a Sounders goal, hopefully. And I, hopefully <laughs> that carried through to the audience that, you know, felt that. And because I feel the way the audience feels when I'm broadcasting for the Quakes, I want them to win. Uh, some people say, oh, too much of a homer or whoever the broadcaster is, the local broadcaster is too much of a homer. But I like a little bit of that sprinkled in um, whether or not, you know, we get back to that at some point. It's it's I don't I don't know. But I the way it's going now, it's just fewer broadcasters, more con, more centralized control. And um, I hope it does well. I mean, the, the more I can see the Quakes, wherever it is the better. So. Well, let me tell you maybe a quick story that'll warm your heart a little bit as, as a local broadcaster. I have a, a son who is seven going on eight. He's autistic um, and has limited communication skills. And uh, a lot of people who've watched a lot of this show knows he likes to try to sneak on the show. Sometimes he doesn't like to wear shirts. You know, one of his uh, autism things he'll wear to school when he's home, doesn't want to wear shirts. So He'll try to sneak onto the show when he thinks I'm not looking and uh, try to see himself on the camera. And then he'll try to run out and, and actually bring up the show on a tablet and try to see himself. But one of his things these days is to turn on the Aftershock and also to turn on older Quakes games, but only, only the ones where you are the announcer making the goal calls because he wants to hear goal san jose so would you mind doing the call for us one more time as if there was an actual goal here let's we christian espinoza just scored a banger can you can you give us the call one more time for old time's sake i will do it and my i am in the house i'm in the back bedroom i'm in the house with my son my 17 year old son and my wife and i have not warned them that this was going to happen so <laughs> If somebody does open the door and wonder what's wrong with me, then um, I will I will definitely tell them. But I can give you one. Um, so let's just say uh, or Christian Espinoza or the Marco Orania goal against Minnesota. Oh, there, there's a good the one. Playoffs, I will give you a goal, San Jose. All right. And we don't get to see you say it. So usually we're just listening to it this time. A little bit extra because we get to we got to see you say it. By the way, I I had a bet. Let's see if I'm right. Favorite call uh, from the earthquake side that 2017 game. You mentioned it. My that was going to be my guess. Did I get it right? Yeah, you did. Um, Wando has had some had some classico goals uh, at Stanford um, that we were able to do because uh, we, surprisingly, it may be a surprise or not to you. A lot of the games played in. Um, at Stanford, those classical games, we didn't do on TV. Mm. So those were done by the national broadcast. Right, that's, and that's we, true. we just did a couple of radio in 2012 and 2013, and there were some good games there. But, yeah, that has to be up there. I mean, that was um, – if you remember that game, I think Minnesota went up – did young Grey Goose score a goal in that game? I forget. I don't remember, but um, for for the – it was, two, it was 2-2, two, two, that much I know, but when the, when the final goal was scored, it was 2-2. Two, two. But the Quakes were down, I think, 2-1, and didn't they tie it 2-2? Two, two? I don't – anyway. Uh, it's, I, think Minnesota, I think Minnesota tied it 2-2 two, two, okay. um, on a, some sort of mistake in the back or breakaway or something like that. I think it was a 1-1 one one Okay. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that, that atmosphere, uh, you know, a fall afternoon with the shadows starting to creep in and the celebration was kind of right down in front of us to our right. And yeah. um, it was just, I mean, that kind of stuff is amazing. It's what I love about doing it so much is you don't know what's going to happen. Um, and in so many aspects of our lives, we kind of have an idea what's going to happen. But 
uh, they made the playoffs and and then I kind of don't remember what happened after that. I blacked out and I don't know what happened in <laughs> Vancouver. I'm not sure what happened in Vancouver, but yeah, uh, yeah that, that has to be one of them. And, and so much fun doing the games for, for those years. I was right behind the goal uh, when it happened, but I had enough people in front of me. I didn't see the ball go in. So, uh, cause we, we had to like hightail it out of the stadium for an appointment. And right. so we were waiting behind the goal, just waiting for the game to end and, and to see what was going to happen and expecting the worst, of course, at that time. And, um, you know, and then, and then that goal happened and, you know, not seeing it go in, but seeing the reaction of everyone and just the craziness. I don't think I've experienced the pandemonium uh, at the stadium quite like that. Uh, I don't remember if that's the number one seismic moment in the stadium. Oh. And you know how they used to uh, probably, yeah, still yeah, do, yeah. you know, do the, uh, si- si- what do they call it? Seismometers or whatever the heck they, they oh, call those gosh. earthquake yeah, yeah. reader things. Anyway. Um, but it, uh, it, it certainly, certainly was up there. That was, that was a pretty crazy time. Were you calling the, the, uh, the, um, Simon Dawkins goal against Toronto, uh, where the quicks were down two men. Were you on the call that game? Yeah, we were. And I thought, you know, you should, as a broadcaster, you try not to let it come through your, your voice or your tone, but I, my shoulders definitely slumped when we went, when the team went down two players and right. to have them come back. And we were doing that game, and that would be up there. Um, Fatai Alashe scored the first goal at – That's that's true. We did, yes, we did. did that game, and oh, that good. was – I think we did that game. That was fantastic. I don't know if that was a John Strong. Uh, was it Quincy Ameriqua who had the near midfield? We the did chip? not get to do that game. Oh, and, you, that uh, was, No, that was a national game. We were at, I was at that game, and just like we didn't get a chance to do Wando breaking the record, the goals record right. against Chicago, because I think we all thought the next game he would get it. He might get one or two goals, but he ended up with four in that game with he a little help from the keeper. The game. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. So those were some new I was misses, not at that but... game either. That was like one of the games where I said uh, my wife was out of town. I had to watch a child. Uh, you know, and my, my, my younger son, as I mentioned, yeah, uh, yeah. was, was even younger, much, much younger at the time. And uh, I had to watch him for that game. And I told Joel, sorry, I said, I, I can't make this one. And then that happens. Yeah. Yeah. I want to break um, the record. <laughs> but, but Ted Ramey has a great call if you hadn't heard it. So be sure and, and check that out. And Ted does a fantastic job with Joe on the radio. So, um, and, and also working, what I remember most about that is working with that group. Um from the TV uh, truck, the, the producers, directors, and the graphics folks. I mean, I'm still, you know, connected with them on social media. And when I get a chance to see him, a big hug. And Danger and I will go out and have dinner every now and then. He, he and his wife and me and my wife. And, um, you know, I I used to fill in for Ted Ramey's dad at KCBS in the afternoons uh, when when Hal Ramey couldn't, couldn't work or was on vacation. So um, it's all kind of a tight-knit group. Um, I do miss working with them, but, um, you know, I'm still following the quakes and still doing my thing here. Well, one of the reasons I reached out to you was because you were, you were there at Levi's stadium, looked like you were enjoying the game, uh, yes. on that particular day. And I, and I also saw that it looks like you caught the last home game as well. So clearly staying very connected with the team, um, and, and as much as you're, you're able to, you know, your thoughts on the first year, you know, under Lucha Gonzalez and what you've seen from this team. Well, first of all, when was the last time we were talking about a team within shouting distance of the top spot in the Western Conference in mid Oh, they're like just a few points out. Like like they could right. be in second place after this weekend if they win. So it had, to, it had to have been 2012, right? I mean, we're talking over a decade. I don't think yeah. they were in this position back when they made the playoffs in 17 and 20. Um, but uh, so obviously something's working. Um uh, so excited for Christian Espinoza to finally start putting goals with his assists and continue mm-hmm. to do both very well. Um, to have Cade Cowell and guys like Nico Chikiris and Jeremy Obobese. And um, I was in preparation for this because I'm a play-by-play person by nature. I prepare for everything. So when we were doing this, I'm like, do I remember it the way I thought I remembered it? <laughs> um, this group of players and having had a chance to talk with a lot of the guys and last year during the season and a couple of years, um, you, you root for these guys. Um, we don't, I don't think we have anybody on the team that is a um, 
someone who's you're not proud to call an earthquake. So even though they had a tough result last time out against Houston and we were, I was at the Portland game and it, they what, we hit a, hit a cross, hit a, hit a bar uh, or a post. Twice, I think, yeah. yeah. Hit the bar twice. And I was so close. It does kind of take it back to, Oh, we just came so close. We didn't quite get it. Uh, I think Lucci's uh, was the right um, tonic for what ALD earthquakes. Um, yes. You see him out in the field and, and, you know, I, I see some of the social media things that the Quakes uh, staff has done, kind of highlighting how he interacts with the guys and things like that. And uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for the team and I'm excited for a playoff run. And uh, I know they've made changes to the playoff structure over the last handful of years, but however the Quakes need to get in, I think they can do it. And it's just, you know, every season has this, unless right. you're that 2012 team that always just seemed to be at the highest <laughs> level. Um, yeah, you're down. But, you're down two goals, but you're gonna do the Goonie thing and come back. No big deal. Oh my gosh! And they're gonna give away blonde wigs, and it'll be a buckshot, and then you'll score the goal and put it on and run around. Um, so I'm excited for the for the season. I haven't watched as much as I would normally if I were broadcasting. So I I would hate to say, you know, they get into anything technical. But um, uh, Daniel, I mean, Daniel was fantastic against uh, Portland when we saw him. So assuming those guys stay healthy, which is always the knock on wood moment, right? Then That's I right. think this team, this team has a wood real right there. I'm going to, I'm going to knock on it. <laughs> there you go. But I think the team um, has a real good opportunity now miss some chances to do some things against Portland and not get a goal or result and have had some, some tough moments on the road, but uh, defending, defending a uh, home turf. And that's uh, the first step and they're doing it. First so step. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, absolutely. St. Louis city on Saturday, um like i said the earthquakes really just three points out of second place like two through seven i think in the western conference right now is is separated by three points so really could go any direction particularly for those home playoff spots i know a lot of people miss you anthony i really appreciate you coming by the show today my son very clearly misses the goal call i'm definitely going to show it to him later today and just try to see what his reaction is but i really appreciate you Stopping by the aftershock. I hope we can have you back sometime too. Yeah, anytime. Like I said, this is the first summer I've had off in uh, probably, uh, what, 15, 20 years. So I'm here and I'm following the quakes and following the aftershock. And so keep up the great work and and uh, go quakes. Yeah. And if you ever want to host a post game show, you know, we've got a place for you, right? We don't pay very well. I like to say we don't really pay at all. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're interested, the gig would be yours. I'm pretty sure Phil would let you do it and be an analyst that night just to have you on the show. Well, I would appreciate that. I'll probably reach out. I'm I'm likely going to get stir crazy in probably another few weeks, but uh, the pay is not a big deal. Any broadcaster that got into it for pay is uh, is uh, probably making a mistake. So <laughs> probably for, for the wrong reasons. <laughs> Thanks so much, Anthony. Good to talk to you and uh, enjoy the uh, game this weekend. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks again. All right, take care. All right.